There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, a boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, chromium, lithium, beryllium, and barium. In the last video, we talked about how we can make nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas, so the building blocks of what we need to make ammonia. And we said that we can make nitrogen gas either through fraction distillation of air or through the reaction with methane, so air with methane. And we said that fraction distillation of air does not often get used because it's too expensive, whereas the reaction air with methane is the common way that we can get nitrogen gas. And we also talked about how we can get hydrogen gas. We said that the electrolysis of water was one way that we could get hydrogen gas, but we also said that that's not something that we usually do because it's a bit too expensive as well. Whereas the common way to get hydrogen gas is the reaction of methane with steam. So that's the more common way. So after we've discussed this part, what we have to discuss now is if we have these building blocks, how can we make ammonia? More specifically, what kind of reaction is this reaction? So uh, the reason why I says, say this is because the dot point itself says describe how the synthesis, so how synthesis means how the making of ammonia occurs as a reversible reaction that will reach equilibrium. Right? So we have to talk about how kind of ammonia gets produced and that this is a reversible reaction which can reach equilibrium. So this obviously suggests that it is a reversible reaction because it has errors which go either way. Now the bad thing with this when it comes to producing ammonia is naturally this is a, if nothing changes, this is a reaction which favors the left hand side. So by itself in nature we have much more, more reactants than products. Right? So if nothing changes, if we don't change any of the factors, we'll have many more of the reactants when we reach equilibrium than we do our products. Right? So that's a problem because we want to get more of the products, but we have more of the reactants if we don't do anything. Right? So that's one of the problems. So what could we do to try to increase, so shift the whole thing to the right. Right? We want to shift it to the right, and that means we make more ammonia. What could we do to that? Well, remember Le Chatier's principle? There's generally there's three things we can do. We can either change the concentration, change the concentrations of reactants or products. Reactants would be these and products would be these. We can change the temperature and the pressure. Now in the next probably five or so videos, we'll discuss all this in more detail as well. But quickly, I mean, one of the problems as well is because it reaches equilibrium, what that means at some stage, there's going to be a point where no further um, ammonia will be produced. So for example, if this is the equilibrium, that means we have one ammonia and we have one mole of ammonia, so this is ammonia, what, two moles of nitrogen and one, two, three, four, five, six, six moles of hydrogen gas. And this will stay like this, it won't change. But the problem is we don't want it to stay still. We want it to keep moving. We want it to keep producing more and more ammonia. So we need to also find some way that we can break this equilibrium to make sure we can keep producing ammonia. We don't want it to reach equilibrium, but this reaction reaches equilibrium by itself. So we have to figure out a way we can change that, right? So this is what we'll cover in this video but we'll also cover it much more in the next couple of videos as well. So first, what I want to talk about is the actual process. It's called the Haber process. This is the process that we use to make nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas combine to form ammonia. And this was named after the person Haber who made this process. I'll go over the details in a second. But this is the chemical reaction that actually we discussed a couple times already. We've got ammonia, sorry, we've got nitrogen gas, We've got hydrogen gas, we've got ammonia. It's also exo, so there should be a minus here. It's exothermic, exothermic, which means if it goes this way, if ammonia is produced, that means it releases energy, it releases heat. And the interesting part is to make this happen, we have a temperature usually about 500 degrees Celsius, and we have a catalyst, so an iron catalyst. So these are usually present as well. So I'll ask a question, what happens to the ammonia yield, and yield means the amounts of ammonia being produced, amounts of ammonia being produced. So for high yield would mean we have lots of ammonia being produced, and low yield would be low ammonia being produced. So what happens to the yield of ammonia if the temperature increases? So if we increase the temperature, 
So we, we've just said we've, we increase, say we increase to 500 degrees Celsius. Because this is an exothermic reaction, what will actually happen is it will shift to left. It will not, because it will have to, that increase in temperature has disturbed the equilibrium. And it's not going to go to right because that means it's going to make, release even more heat, make it even hotter. It wants to counteract that change. So it's going to go the other way. It's going to absorb heat, which means it's going to favor the reactants, which makes little sense if you think about it. We want to make more ammonia. Why would we increase the temperature to make it go to the left-hand side? And I'll, I'll cover why in a second. So if we increase the temperature, that means we have more reactants being produced, which means a lower yield of ammonia. Right? So reactants are these, and it means we would have more of these and less of ammonia. What happens if the pressure is increased? Well, pressure increase means we have less space. Here we have two moles, uh, sorry, four moles, and here we have two moles, four to two. So this here takes up more space than this. If we have more pressure, which means we have less space, we're going to go to the space-saving version, which means we're going to go shift to the right which means if we increase the pressure, we're going to have more product being produced. And what happens if the reactant is removed? So what happens, sorry, if I wanted to write, what happens if the product is removed? So what happens if ammonia itself is removed? So if this goes down because we remove it from the actual container, well, that means it's going to shift to the right. We said if any of the actual, any of the actual products gets removed, it's going to be a shift to produce more products. Right, so if we, if we remove the product, in this case ammonia, that means there's going to be more ammonia being produced because it wants to counteract that change to produce ammonia by shifting to the right. right so these are three things you should know. Tem temperature being increased means we have more reactant being produced, so more of this, which means less ammonia. Whereas the other ones, pressure increase and product being removed, all favor ammonia being produced. Now, why did I say all this? Because this, all these play a role when it comes to the harbor process, which we'll cover in more detail in the next couple of videos. This is the gist of it. We have the reactants. So we've got not, we have the reactants here, which will go into this tube right here. We have, it will go this way. It will go through a catalyst. We said this was the iron catalyst. And there'll also be a quite high temperature, about 500 degrees Celsius in there as well. Then we'll have ammonia being built here. Now I'll cover this in more detail in a second. We'll have ammonia being built here. And only if every time, every cycle, so this will go in cycles, for every cycle, only about 10% of these reactants will actually turn into ammonia. So only about 10% will turn into ammonia, which means we still have some leftover hydrogen gas and nitrogen gas. And what will happen then is that something will actually condense out. And why would it condense out? Why would ammonia, in this case, condense out? You look at the boiling points. We've got nitrogen, minus 195, hydrogen, minus 100, 259, and ammonia, which is what we just produced a bit of it, has a very low, comparatively speaking, boiling point of minus 30, 33 degrees Celsius. Here we send a coolant through. So this is going to be water, cold water, which means the thing that has the lowest boiling point will actually become a liquid. It's, it's a gas here but it will go and become liquid. And that liquid can then be collected. And liquid itself will be only ammonia. It won't be hydrogen gas, nitrogen gas, because their boiling point is too high, which means the gas, the remaining gas, will move through that cycle again for it to happen again. Right? I'll go over this again in this diagram here. So first, this is, these are the main steps. First, we have our reactants, which we said that was nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas. And nitrogen gas is obviously N2, so there's two molecules attached. Then what happens is it goes into the first part, it's called the compressor. What the compressor does is it increases the pressure, increases pressure. Remember, we want to have pressure being increased because that means we're going to be producing more of our ammonium. And also what the pressure does, it actually breaks these apart. So here they were together. Now what happens is they're going to be by themselves. So they're, they're broken apart. Next step is these broken part ones will enter the chamber. This is often called the tower. And here, they will come in contact with the iron catalyst. These white dots are the iron catalyst. So we're, this is where one of the nitrogen will combine, meet three of the hydrogen, and ammonia is being formed. So ammonia forms on these iron catalysts. They speed up the reaction. 
as now we have am ammonia being formed. But remember, I said only about every time, every time there's a cycle, only about 10% of the total reactants will actually turn into ammonia, which means the other ones will still be in their normal form that we had just now. And then what happens next is after their couple have formed, all of the different types, either ammonia or the gas, will go into this cooling chamber. And what happens? Well, because the ammonia has a lot lower boiling point, the ammonia will actually con condensate out, it will become a liquid. And that means it can be removed, it can be drained. So there's ammonia here, what I just drew, will go down and become liquid. So we can remove it from the whole equilibrium. And the rest, because it's still in a gaseous form, will not be condensed, it will be gaseous still, and it will continue the cycle. It will go back, and then it will start the whole thing again, until basically we've produced enough ammonia. Now, why is this important? Why are a couple of things important? Why is it important that we remove ammonia? So ammonia here is actually removed from the equilibrium. Remember I said that after a while, the reaction itself will go to equilibrium. But what happens if we constantly remove ammonia? Right? This is ammonia here. We're removing the product, on a, so the product is removed here, that means it's constantly going to shift to the right. It's going to try to produce more and more ammonia because the product has been removed. So that's one way we can actually make more ammonia is by removing ammonia whenever it's been produced. And also, we said the print pressure has increased to make sure we have more ammonia being produced. But now, interesting, why is the temperature increased? Why do we have 500 degrees Celsius if theoretically 500 degrees Celsius is not very useful for us? Because that will actually decrease the yield of ammonia. But the thing is, we want to have it move it move through quite fast, right? it has to move through quite fast, and if it's in a gaseous form, the, the higher the temperature, the faster it will move. So basically it's a trade-off. Even though the temperature is not good for the amount of ammonia being produced, it's good for the, the amount of speed that it will go through it. It wants to go through fast, that's why we have the temperature 500 degrees Celsius, just so it can move through fast. We know we're going to lose a bit of ammonia, but it's a trade-off. We're going to lose a bit of ammonia, but we're going to make it move a bit faster. So basically we're trying to tweak it, to get the most amount. Even though it's not that good for the yield of ammonia, everything will go faster, so overall it's better. But even if this is still a bit confusing, don't worry too much. We're going to cover this in a lot more detail in the next couple of videos. But also what I want you to watch now is, I want you to watch this part of this video. It's also the next video in the playlist, but it's very useful because whatever all the things I've just said are basically put into an animation, right? So follow this link right after this video. But I'll keep this link here, but um, I'm quickly just going to summarize the dot point again. You need to describe how the synthesis of ammonia occurs as a reversible reaction that will reach equilibrium. As this is the, this is the reaction here, it will reach equilibrium by itself, so eventually there's going to be no more, no change if we do nothing else, if we don't disturb the equilibrium, right, because it's a reversible reaction. So what we do is we change the temperature pressure and the concentration of products tweak it to make sure we constantly produce ammonia. So if you can, follow the link now and have a look at the animation. But hopefully that was useful. Thank you for watching.